In this video, I'd like to share with you some, some highlights and some clips from a, a recent presentation that I did. This was an interesting presentation because it dealt with the Federation of European Biochemical Societies, FEBS, Education Committee. So this was interesting in that these were all high level people in academia, and they were asking some really great questions associated with ChatGPT, how can we integrate it with education, and what can we do to maximize the learning experience for the students as well as for the instructors in order to be efficient and to use AI to its fullest capability. So I hope you enjoy some of these uh, great highlights from this great uh, organization. I recently published this book, AI Literacy Imperative. I looked at a lot of different research associated with what is AI literacy. I tried to put it all together into four different components, and that is awareness, capability, knowledge, and critical thinking. Four simple components, but within each one, it houses lots of different aspects. So those are key components there. The knowledge aspect also is important, dealing with understanding things such as deep fakes and the, uh, the, what can be created with AI. It can be used in good ways. It can be used in bad ways. So again, AI literacy is a huge imperative that everyone needs to have, especially our students, because in order for them to be competitive in the world, they're going to have to have this type of skill. I came up with a technique called the share technique, and this is designed specifically to help you as faculty in redesigning assignments and assessment. So we have these different components, meaning strong and more authentic, high price for false information, additional and or other assessment techniques, reflection and critical analysis of feedback, and then expanding assignment into multiple pieces. So from here, we need to understand that what we're doing is we're trying to manage and integrate AI into instruction. We're not trying to prevent AI, we're trying to manage it so that it's appropriately used. That's why AI literacy still needs to be an aspect of whatever we do. That right there addresses this instructional need uh, to address the teaching and, and mitigate some of the things going on within our classroom. But then that final part there of continuously learning about AI developments, that's a key, key part. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by attending presentations like this. Right? That's, that's a major way to do that, but as well as going through conferences about reading, uh, buying books about this, uh, following Twitter. Uh, there's lots of great discussions, debates going on about different aspects of AI in education. Uh, again, I want to do another plug for my, my YouTube channel there because I'm, I'm definitely trying to push out that information, but what I'd really love to do is try to develop a community of inquiry a community of, of learners where we're debating, where we're talking about these things, asking questions, giving answers, and constantly thinking about what we can do to enhance this so that we can create the best educational experience possible for both the faculty as well as the students. Thank you, Brent. You gave a great introduction to the, uh, to the topic and some hints and tips for us all, because my main question was how any educator who is not much involved with uh, AI before can start, where he or mm. she can start. Yeah, so I, I have this other video that talks about it, but and also an infographic, right? And it deals with this continuum. That's the way we have to view this, is that this is a continuum of integration. No one ha should be feeling out there, there should be no faculty out there that should be feeling that, oh, okay, I have to switch everything to AI. AI has to be part of everything. No, 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 no. If you're not ready for that, that's perfectly fine. It's a continuum. You should start off by simply saying, hey, class, I'm aware of AI. For right now, we're only going to use it to have a discussion. So we could discuss about AI. It's not being used in anything else, just a discussion. Then we could do things where we could have a discussion about it. And I just taught uh, a, an issue dealing with some topic. And we could say, hey, you know what? Let's ask the AI to see what it says. And you could pose that question directly to AI. It could be done live, or you could have done it ahead of time, done a screen capture, put that in there in your PowerPoint and say, look, Look at what the AI answers in this way. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about that AI answer. Do you see how it's correct? Do you see how it's wrong? What are the problems with the way the AI is viewing this? So again, you can use it as a, as a teaching resource as well. And then you can move on for that by maybe you, ha you have a project where you use the AI in class that, you know, where you're, you can still control it. And then you can move on to having AI used as for part of the assignment then move on to maybe a, a larger part of the assignment. So there's many, many different levels, many different ways to use the AI for sure. Is there a need for another tool to uh, detect this kind of cheating, this kind of uh, incorrectnesses? Right. So, okay. So that's, that's a whole other thing. 
uh, you're talking mm -hmm. about AI text detection, right? So for AI text detection, yeah, there are different programs out there. Turnitin now has a component dealing with AI text detection. There's a few others. But the biggest part to that is understanding that AI text detection isn't 100%. In fact, if you have English as a secondary language, it's more likely to give a false positive. So you can never use an AI text detector to say for sure that, hey, yeah, this person cheated. No, instead, it needs to be a multiple of aspects associated with that, meaning what, uh, you know, why do you think that, that, they, that, that they might have done this? Do you have previous work that they've done and comparing it to, to that, it seems like it's completely different. Have you put in the prompt dealing with the assignment into AI to see what it gives you and then compare that with what your student gave and see, wow, this looks very familiar, the formatting, the way that the information is being put forward. Yeah, that would be some techniques, but it's going to have to be way more evidence than simply an AI text detector. Now, the share yes. technique, the share technique, the idea there is that you can help to incentivize students to do the right thing so that they can properly use AI in the right way when you want them to. And then when you don't want them to, you need to be very upfront and telling them not only that you don't want them to use AI for this specific assignment, but also being sure to explain why. Why don't you want them to use AI? Because more and more students now are going to be so integrated with using AI for everything that they're going to be expecting a really good answer. So you need to be ready to explain that, well, right now we're developing skills mastery with this specific subject. Later on, we'll be having an assignment where we can incorporate AI. But for now, I'm really trying to assess your capabilities with this. So that's the key is to making sure that we're explaining these things to the students so they understand the relevancy, they understand the importance of when and how to use the AI. Great question, Mohammed. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And there are a couple of, uh, Ariella commented, it seems like many of these things create more work for the lecturers. Would you agree or disagree, Brent? It, it, it totally depends, right? It, it is yet another thing, right? Something, something new to think about. Um, but we, it's something that we have to address and we have to try to figure out what's the most effective way to use it because it's only going to get better from, from here on out. It's only going to get more advanced in different ways. So we have to think, well, how can we use this in education? What is appropriate? What isn't appropriate? Should we be using it to help us with grading? Well, that's a whole ethical thing. That's a whole separate show, right? But those are different questions that are being evolved in order for us to save time, maybe, so that we can dedicate that more to the teaching process. So again, there's lots of things to consider, and it is going to be a bumpy ride. I, I will totally agree with that. Uh, in align with this, I would like to ask, do we have the responsibility to teach AI literacy to our students? Right. So I am on a mission, right? I'm on a <laughs> mission dealing with AI literacy that, yes, I very much believe that, that it is our responsibility. I am working right now to develop a program for our university where I work at that because I'm going to try to push to get this integrated in throughout the, the, the entire curriculum. If you remember probably like 15, 20 years ago, where the whole aspect of critical thinking became a super important thing, and then it got integrated into all parts of the curriculum. In the same way, AI literacy is at that level. I fully believe it's that important of a thing that all students need to have these capabilities. Now, don't get me wrong, plenty of students will, again, think that they know about AI because they're using it, right? But that doesn't mean that they know how to use it appropriately. They don't know the different aspects of it. They don't know what's right, what's wrong, or the different components dealing with AI literacy. So I think it's still extremely important. Okay. And there is another question. I wonder if the students' critical thinking skills are affected by AI. Yeah. 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 That, that's a that's a major, major question. So there's a... a a, a couple of months ago, uh, OpenAI, which is a company that released ChatGPT, they released a uh, technical uh, journal article, and it talked about, they, they used this, uh, this term, right? now it's a scientific term, over-reliance. Over-reliance is a real danger that is going to be occurring because of AI, meaning that, oh, I see that AI is really good at this, so now I don't have to know about this anymore. I don't have to learn this anymore. I can let AI do that. Now, of yeah. course, AI is going to be able to do more and more, but we still have to make sure that we have fundamental skills mastery so that we can use the AI as a tool to do much more. It's the same thing. And again, I don't like the comparison, but this is used a lot because it's a very easy thing for understand. The calculator, right? The calculator yeah. came out. Now, 
it, it is totally incorrect for us to say the calculator is out, so I don't need to know math. What? That doesn't make any sense. No, you still very much need to know fundamentals of math so that now you could use that calculator to do way more advanced things. So that's the way that we have to understand this. The people that are going to really succeed with AI are the people that already have this capability without the AI. And now using the AI, they'll be able to do so much more. That's the way that we have to frame it and push it to the students as well. Uh, another question is, in the case of online teaching, what do you recommend to avoid the use of AI by the students when they do the tasks? Right. Yeah. I mean, that's that's a that's a hard thing to, to really think about, even in academic integrity in general. Right. If you're talking about online instruction, there's all sorts of different aspects going on there. What I would really do is take a good, long, hard look at what the requirements are for the course and what are those student learning outcomes? What is it that we're truly teaching them? Is it their ability to write? Is that my student learning outcome? Uh, I'm sure that is for you know some fundamental lower level things, freshman seminar essays, yes. But then even then it's this matter of, okay, is that what I'm teaching them? Is that what my outcome is? Or am I wanting them to put information together? Am I wanting them to be able to create a, a good product and then be able to explain that as well? So do we need to have components of where they're giving the presentation in order to express that they know what it is that they even wrote about? So there's gonna be some lots of things that we have to do in this redesign whether that's face-to-face -face or online, to ensure that the students are truly grasping the content that we're teaching them. Yeah, it's going to be a mixture of things. That shared technique, it will definitely need to come into play. And even then, even the whole aspect of writing becomes something to really think about. Because here's the situation, here's the reality of it. And this was the reality last semester, right? Because the AI has already been out, ChatGPT, generative AI has already been out since November. Here's the reality. I have students right now that they graduate. They graduate and they go to try to get a job. And when they're going to those job interviews, they're being asked, okay, what is your experience dealing with AI? And if they turn around and say, well, at my university, it was completely banned and we weren't allowed to use AI. Oh, okay, next, right? So that's just it. We need to help them be able to use the AI. And in some cases we should be teaching them, how can I use AI to write better? How can I use AI to write more? Because that's a real skill that's being learned that, 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 that they're going to need on the job. Now, again, I, I used to teach freshman seminars. So I used to teach essay writing. I think it's very important. It's a fundamental skill. You learn so much by writing. I agree with all that. But on, on top of that, we also need to be realistic in what's expected of them when they join the workforce. That's going to be an important skill as well. I think this was a great comment. Thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Another question is what, why ChatGPT is sometimes assigned to plagiarism, connected to plagiarism? Right, right. So, so it's interesting. An article that I wrote, a research article I wrote, is an opinion piece, but it talks about this, right? There's a huge argument because how do you even define plagiarism? If you go to most universities' websites, They'll have a section on cheating and they'll have a section on plagiarism, right? Plagiarism will be fitting within cheating. And the plagiarism section says copying or using someone else's work. To begin with, we have a problem right there. Someone, right? ChatGPT isn't a someone, it's a thing, it's a tool. So you have that. And then you, you could make the argument, oh, well, the student just put in a prompt and then they got this response and they copied it. That's not their own work. I would argue with that. I would say, hey, what are you talking about? Who put in the prompt? I worked really hard to create that prompt to make it really detailed and, and, and exact for what I'm looking for. And then it gave me a result. Now I took that result and I used it because I created it. I worked on it. That's my effort. And then the other thing is, that, again, thinking about how we define uh, plagiarism. Generally, when we say plagiarism, we're saying some, that it, this existed before I made an, a contact with it. Show me where what I copied from ChatGPT existed before I did that. So if it didn't exist before I created it with ChatGPT, how is that plagiarism, right? So again, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of arguments for and against, but what I strongly recommend is that when we're talking about this, as far as telling students not to use AI for this certain thing, we don't even bring up plagiarism. We just say within our policy that, hey, if you're using AI when the instructor told you not to, that's cheating. So now we don't even have to have this argument about plagiarism, save that for the academics. 
if they're using something that they're not supposed to, even if it was another book, I mean, this is a closed book test, it'd be the same thing. So I would, I would strongly encourage faculty to focus on that part in order to make it easier for like ethics and grievances committees and things like that, that focus on, that's a cheating aspect. You weren't allowed to use it and move from there. Don't even bring in the aspect of plagiarism. Thank you for the very interesting lecture. Do you think AI can motivate students to work on they, their own instead of waiting for the teacher ready message or conclusions to, due to their passivity after distance learning? Mm. Yeah, uh, definitely. And again, this, this, this definitely needs more research to look into. But uh, so I just recently did sort of some action research on my own here and uh, I created a simulation. So this is all you do is you go into the chat GPT and you tell it different components of what you want. You know, you say chat GPT act as this. So a business professional. And I want you to uh, function as a simulation, ask questions about this, let them answer uh, five different questions and then give feedback on the results. And then also you wanna put in some sort of scenario. So the specific thing that I did is I'm teaching my students about networking. And with that, they're going to be required to go out and do an actual interview with someone that they don't know in the field that they want to go into. So to give to try and give them more experience, I created a simulation where they're answering questions. Because first they went through and answer questions. Next, they're going to be actually asking questions. But the, in the simulation, they're, they're, they're being interviewed by high school students that want to succeed in college. So since my students are juniors and seniors in college, they have to answer these questions to these high schoolers that are asking them questions, right? And it was only five questions. And then I had them fill out a quick little thing when they were done. And it was very interesting. And in that's many of them expressed that they were like, wow, I, first of all, I didn't know AI could do this. And second of all, the type of words that they were using to describe the experience, they were talking about emotion. They were like, wow, I felt excited helping these students. Uh, I felt, uh, you know, pressure to give them the right answers. I felt, I felt, I felt that's exactly what we need to do when we're trying to get somebody to learn something is to try and get them to have this emotional connection to the information, because that's what gives us long-term learning and true integration into ourselves, right? That transformative learning of what we're looking for. So, yeah, I would definitely say that AI could be used in many different ways to help motivate students. Sure. And Alyosha asks if and when AI will replace teachers' work. Sure, sure. Uh, so that's a great question, and that's exactly what we should be asking, right? Here's the thing. Uh, on, on multiple levels, it's not going to replace teachers. Sure, I could see uh, some maybe lower-level uh, courses having large components that are taught by AI, but that instructor is still going to be a very important part. But I will tell you this, we should be feeling some level of anxiety, some level of stress, because I do think that AI will, will definitely take over the role of instructors that are the low tier instructors, right? So if all I do is come to class, say my lecture and then leave, well, an AI can definitely do that. What we need are instructors that are the ones that can definitely motivate students, that can create opportunities for them to apply their knowledge, that can create excitement about the instruction, that can create this whole environment where the students can, can really thrive, where I can talk to the student and know the student and then incorporate that into the questioning and really create this community. That takes a, a real instructor. It'll be quite a while before an AI can truly do that. So that's gonna be an important thing is, we should be developing, we should be continually improving ourselves so that we can compete on the human element that the AI will definitely be lacking. The people who are waiting in the line, thanks a lot, I agree. It seems to me that AI may include the method called PBL, problem-based learning. Mm. Yeah, yeah, lots of things that you could use that for because you could, and that's the thing, right? Is that you need to think about how to use that AI because you could directly do that. You could say, hey, Here's the topic. The first thing I want you to do is in class, brainstorm. I want you to create an outline in class. And then the next step out of class, I want you to meet and use an AI to come up with some content, to put some things together. Then your next step is gonna to be to verify that content, to make sure that this is correct, to make sure that you have good sources, real sources, right? So you see how I'm using the AI. So it's not this matter of, oh, they're gonna cheat by using AI. No, I'm using it 
in the actual process. Why? Because I want them to understand about the topic. Now, at the end, I might have them turn in a written assignment, but I'm also going to have them go up in front of the class and I'm going to ask them questions about this. The students will ask them questions. So they have to have integrated this information within their own and they have gone through this process. So in that process, they would have learned AI literacy in that process. So it's a win-win. We just have to think it through. Yeah. And now two patient participants, Francesco, please ask your yeah. question. Yeah, thank you for waiting. It's okay. It was a pleasure to to listen to to Brent's talk. Very interesting. I am a computational biochemist when mm -hmm. I have time. <laughs> the rest of the time, I work for other things. But anyway, I'm interested in the computation, and I can do that by using, for example, MATLAB or Mathematica. And in these programs, some actually machine learning algorithms are included. But the main problem I find overall as a general comment is that where do you get the data? I mean, independently from the specific, you know, scientific field, I want, you know, the statistics of, uh, I don't know, of car bumping into each other in the United States. How do I get that? Um, so that's a very specific question. I mean, yeah. I would I would definitely, uh, you know, search for it on, on Google that the, the now you can use Bing because it's directly connected to a search function where you can use the AI to help you find information. So you could use that AI to look for certain information. And then the big thing is in order to ensure that the AI is properly doing what you want, what you can do is you can feed it that information that you found. You can feed that into the AI within your conversation and say, hey, I'm going to feed you a bunch of data. And then based off of that, I want to ask you these questions. So then it would function properly because it's using current information within that conversation of the data that you put in there. So there's a couple different aspects to, to your question. Yeah. And Dimitri, thank you for your patience as well. Yes, I try to be patient. Uh, dear Brent, uh, thank you very much for your talk and answering questions. I have actually quite a few uh questions about everything what i found which is related to francesco's um uh, question is that chat gpt or bard they are completely incapable of gain of giving references mm -hmm. if i tell chat gpt my name where i work from which year to which year and ask show me my publications mm -hmm. it would fail it would show me rubbish so my question, one of my questions is, uh, can we expect that large language models at some point will be integrated with the databases like Google database? Because if I ask the same question, Google, mm -hmm. it will give me very accurate answers, but I need some textual wrapping around it right uh we, which uh, neither chat gpt or bart cannot provide right now so is it going to happen and if yes when we might expect it right yeah great great question uh, so there, there are some aspects of of that of what you can do that are integrated in things like chat gpt plus right because with the chat gpt plus you have the capability of using what's called plugins so there is a selection of different additional ways of using it or additional uh, capabilities that you can select and then have that be part of the AI uh, program itself. So one of them is where you can have access to certain di different databases directly. So there's a couple of different UN databases and some more. It's growing where you can plug that in and say, OK, ChatGPT, I'm going to ask you a question. And now that's where you're going to look for answers. So now it's using its huge pre-trained uh, information in order to understand your question, in order to understand English and processing of what you're even asking. But then for the content of the information, it'll go into those specific databases and then extract that information and then feed that to you. So that's starting to address it. Now, of course, it would be great if all the databases in the world were part of that plugin, but we're not there yet. But yeah, that, that does seem like that could be a future implementation. They're, they're trying to work on different ways to address the problem of false information, of, of creating incorrect hallucinations. And there's a couple of different instances of, of them succeeding, but the way that they've done that is by combining 
different AIs and having them function in a bit of a different way. So they are definitely working on it. I think there will be a solution for it. And I don't think it's going to take that long, but uh, I, I don't have a crystal ball on that. But there's lots of talk about things that are supposed to be happening this winter. So uh, wow. fingers crossed. I, th I And again, this is all going at the speed of light. So it wouldn't surprise me if so by you know by the end of this fall we have something going into the spring yeah great question thank you, I totally very, agree. Th thank you very much because that was actually my question in the chat when i was asking uh should i start paying for chat gpt plus because <laughs> if they actually can do this now i would yeah. consider i would consider this um okay it'd be something to look into for sure mm -hmm. thank you yeah Thank you very much, Brent. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of FEPS Education Committee and on behalf of all the participants, you highlighted very important topics and we are looking forward to hosting you again, maybe next uh, spring or sometime. Great. Well, I appreciate the time. I'm glad I could help. And yeah, definitely let's, let's, uh, let's keep the conversation going in our online communities for sure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll all be followers of you, I, I'm sure. Thank you very yeah. much. Okay. Bye -bye. I.